I have to admit something to you. I have a particular pet peeve that really grinds my gears. Basically, if someone explains the fact of something, yet it seems clear that they don't have an in-depth knowledge on the topic, it bugs me. I respect anyone who says, I don't know, or I think the answer is, but I'm not sure. I think I get especially vexed when professionals trigger this pet peeve of mine. And in this video, you'll understand why. So I stumbled across this video of a few dietitians offering their insight on a series of nutrition myths. And I want to walk through segments of it because some of the information they provide is just plain wrong. In this video, I'm going to correct their wrong statements as well as supply you with studies to back up my claims. Let's hop to. One of the biggest myths that I get from my clients is that I need to skip meals and starve in order to lose weight. It's not true. So if you skip meals, it's gonna have such a negative effect on your body that when you do go to sit down and eat, you'll probably overconsume. The first myth busted is one of skipping meals and how it helps you lose weight. The dietitian argues that it is not true. And I'm here to argue that it can be true and is often true. There have been several studies that have looked at more extreme versions of meal skipping styles of eating like OMAD or one meal a day compared to the more traditional three meals a day and many show improved weight loss skipping two meals a day. I'd also like to point out my pet peeve immediately rears its head. Listen to the explanation offered. So if you skip meals, it's going to have such a negative effect on your body that when you do go to sit down and eat, you'll probably overconsume. It will have such a negative effect. What does that mean? Now, sure, maybe they're lowering the barrier of understanding, but for me, that leaves me unsatisfied. And I'll take it one step further. It makes me doubt that they'd actually be able to argue the effect. I may be nitpicking here, but I see this a lot. I'll show you another example later. In terms of possible negative effects, it's not a shock that if you don't eat food most of the day, you're going to be hungrier than when you eat food. Hopefully I'm not blowing your mind here. But in terms of health effects, the same study shows among the health measures taken, no negative effects, except maybe a slight elevation of LDL cholesterol, but other measures like blood sugar may slightly improve. Okay, on to the next one. The biggest myth that frustrates me the most is that all calories are created equally. A calorie is not just a calorie. It depends on the source of your calories, whether it's coming from caloric dense foods or nutritional dense foods. Caloric dense foods would be more so our cookies, our cakes. We can have a cookie that's 100 calories. We'll eat it, it'll digest really fast. Then it's gonna spike our blood sugar levels where when we start to crash again, we're gonna crave more sugar for that energy pick-me-up. And that can make you gain weight. On the other hand, you can have a banana, which is an example of a nutritionally dense food. This second one is probably going to be one that will forever live in infamy. The myth, the calories are created equal, is 100% not a myth. Now, before you rip my head off, hear me out. A calorie is a unit of energy. It does not take on the characteristics of the food that we associate to it. A calorie can be measured by measuring the heat produced by our body. And that fact alone is completely independent of the food consumed. So a calorie is equal to every other calorie because it will always produce the exact same amount of heat. What many people do is start attaching different qualities to calories, like it coming from a complex carbohydrate. But that's not the definition of a calorie. That's the definition of the food that they've mistakenly also attached to calories. So we must learn to separate the two. I agree with her second point for the most part, that certain foods can spike blood sugar and other foods might not spike blood sugar as much, but leave the calories out of it because both foods will end up in your cells and produce the energy that can be measured. And we will not be able to tell which calories came from which food because they're all the same. 
She conflates these concepts, especially obvious when she discusses the banana and mentions it as a nutrient dense food, which I'm not arguing, but that still isn't a description of calories. It's a description of nutrients. Onwards. And you definitely need to nourish your body if you're trying to lose weight. When we are restricting calories, you are restricting the energy source of your body. You're also restricting the energy source of your brain. And if that's happening, then, you know, very primitive, protective mechanisms start to kick into place where your body senses that as a physiological threat and does start to shift your metabolic balance to burn less because it's getting less. The overall idea is that you have to starve yourself to lose weight. And then this particular dietitian mentions that you are consuming less energy, meaning calories which is sensed as a threat to the body. Again, we're talking a really simplistic explanation of what's actually happening, although she is right about the downward shift in metabolism. If you continuously restrict your calories, your body adjusts by reducing your metabolic rate. It does that by chiefly having the brain no longer allowing expensive movements like fidgeting. So your nerves send fewer signals to your feet and your hands, and you become considerably more complacent, conserving energy, which means that you are using less energy. This is known as a shift in non-exercise activity thermogenesis, or NEAT. But there's one more point that's made, so let's hear that out. And starving yourself can also shrink your muscles. You want to make sure that you're not eating less than 70% of your overall calorie needs. If you do, that's where not only are you probably going to feel extremely hungry and it's going to take you off of any goals that you're setting, but you're probably going to start compromising your muscle mass as well, and that's where weight loss is going to be unhealthy. The narrator mentions that starving yourself shrinks your muscles, and this is true. I do think that more context would be appreciated because it depends on your exercise habits and if you're consuming sufficient protein. But overall, the less food that you consume, the more your muscles are at risk of diminishing. Still, true. Timing of meals is always a big question. Everyone comes to me and they kind of smirk and they think that I'm going to give them a thumbs up when they say, I don't eat after 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock. And I say, oh, all right, <laughs> do you enjoy that? And they say, no. And I say, well, then maybe eating after is okay. Because timing of day is not going to affect weight loss. Calories are what's going to affect weight loss or body fat loss. So if you eat a bunch of additional calories and you're in calorie surplus and those are coming late at night, then that's what's causing something like waking. In this next one, he's talking about the timing of eating and its effects on weight loss. I have nothing to add here. He's right. Timing itself does not stop you from losing weight unless it affects other aspects of your nutrition, like making it more difficult to stick to your nutrition. Next, skipping breakfast. Ooh, scary. And what about eating first thing in the morning? It depends on the body and it depends on the person and their relationship with food. For a lot of people, me included, if I don't eat a meal, I usually feel like very deprived and it's like I want to make up for it later. If that happens, then that's where we can add in like a lot of calories. Personally, I'm a huge advocate of breakfast. Our body runs on fuel and food is our fuel. So if we have our breakfast, then we feel we have more sustained energy throughout the day. So she mentions that it depends on the person and that she tends more towards encouraging eating breakfast. I have to agree that it depends on the person. I don't think breakfast is necessary or anything, but it can have certain advantages for people who do not enjoy fasting in the morning or if you exercise in the morning and don't expect to get any protein for the next six to eight hours. Eating in the morning can be a benefit. However, your body is more than capable of dealing with not eating in the morning and even in the afternoon because it will adjust your hormones to keep, as the dietitian pointed out, your energy levels sustained. Your body does that by releasing cortisol, lowering insulin, increasing glucagon, among other hormonal changes. And these changes will have widespread effects by increasing liver release of glucose, sugar, to sustain blood sugar levels in a livable range, while reducing the reliance on blood sugar for energy as the cells slowly transition, assuming their cellular makeup is capable, to fat metabolism. 
This is where cortisol can affect your fat cells and get them to release more fat molecules to be taken up by other cells of the body. All of this assumes your liver has run low on stored glucose, sugar, which may not be the case. So ultimately, it may be a moot point, especially if you simply skip breakfast, meaning that you're only abstaining from food for something like 12 or 14 hours. The point is, either way you go, you'll be fine. And as it turns out, fat isn't the only nutrient you can keep in your diet and still lose weight. One of the biggest myths I get about carbs is that you must omit them from your diet to lose weight or my body doesn't digest them well and I have to omit them because I never lose weight unless I restrict myself. It's not true. In this next one, I have to agree with her. It's entirely possible to eat carbohydrates and lose weight, lose body fat, as we see in just one study of many that consuming 60% of one's nutrition from carbohydrates still leads to weight loss and fat loss. There are many studies showing weight loss while consuming carbohydrates. Heck, I've done it many times and kept weight controlled, but I think the studies are more convincing. However, they lose me on this next point. And it's just not sustainable. It's almost impossible to have a no-carb diet. Fruits and vegetables are known as carbohydrates, and we must get those for their nutrients. Now, I agree that it's difficult to have a no-carb diet, and the narrator mentions it isn't sustainable, yet there's thousands of people that swear by a low-carb diet and have had fantastic results losing weight. So sure, maybe a no-carb diet is disproportionately difficult, but a very low-carb diet is not only possible, but used by many people to great effect. To back this up, there are also plenty of studies that show significant weight loss with a low-carb diet. As one example from this study, overweight individuals on a low-carb diet for 24 weeks experienced over 10 kilograms of weight loss. Okay, now, remember when I said this? I have a particular pet peeve that really grinds my gears. Basically, if someone explains the fact of something yet it seems clear that they don't have an in-depth knowledge on the topic, it bugs me. Well, here's a prime example in this final point. But there are some products better left on the shelf. The diet sodas are terrible with all the additives preservatives in them, and the hidden sugars. A lot of the added sugars or the synthetic sugars that are supposed to be great because they don't release insulin, which then doesn't cause a spike in blood sugar levels. But internally, if we don't stimulate the release of insulin, those sugars, the synthetic sugars, go to the liver, build up around the liver, hinder the functioning of the liver, and then can lead to non-alcoholic fatty disease. Notice how the description is, it builds up around the liver and causes non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, there are a lot of details that just didn't get brought up. Like, how does that happen? What does a buildup mean? Okay, I get that they're looking for a quick answer, but there are still ways of explaining the mechanism quickly that go beyond a buildup around the liver. But maybe that's because the literature is shaky on the topic, which is where she should have said, this topic is still being investigated and we don't have a clear answer. Because the literature shows a correlation between non-nutritive sweeteners like aspartame, saccharin, and so on, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But a correlation does not mean that these sweeteners actually cause non-alcoholic liver disease. So what's the deal? Well, there is a recent small analysis of 12 studies that included studies that directly probed this question, among others. So the researchers looked for studies that directly switched out sugary drinks for non-nutritive sweetened drinks. And what did they find? They found improved weight, lower body fat, and lower liver fat. So directly the opposite of what's being recommended here. Now, until I do my own analysis of the data, I'll keep my own recommendations under a tight lid, but at least we can say that there's conflicting research that indicates the direct opposite of what's being claimed here. So the mechanism of building up around the liver causing non-alcoholic fatty liver disease does not seem to bear out considering these 12 studies indicate reduced fat in the liver. 
One more thing. If you have one can of soda or some other beverage that contains sugar, real or artificial or naturally sweetened, don't get worried if you have it once a week or something benign like that. It will have negligible impact on any health parameter, regardless of who's right here. All in all, they got a few things right, and they were completely off on some others. But if you're interested in more of this style of debunking and fact-checking, maybe seeing if there are some that are better than others, then I'd highly recommend that you check out some of my other similar content that I'll link for you. And with that, I'll hope to speak with you in the next video. Thanks for stopping by.